This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. From poverty to the podium, speaker and author Steve Wilmer on this edition of Conversations. On paper, the odds were against Steve Wilmer. He grew up in poverty, in the projects, without a father. Fortunately, success is not determined by what's on paper, but rather what's in the heart. And for Wilmer, those odds were in his favor. After graduating high school, he became a United States Marine, serving eight years. Wilmer would later go on to spend a decade in law enforcement before entering the business world and becoming successful in the insurance business. That would lead to his current career as a speaker, trainer, and now author. Wilmer's book on achieving in life and business is entitled 10 to Win. We welcome Steve Wilmer to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Are you kidding me? Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. It's my <laughs> pleasure. What a story. You grew up in poverty, in the projects, as I mentioned. Now you are out teaching people how to be successful. Let me <laughs> let me ask you, how did how did you go from, from there to where you are today? Oh my goodness. We only have 28 minutes, right? We, got, we do, we got plenty of time. <laughs> uh, well, you, you know the story. You know, grew up right here in Pensacola, uh, born and raised, and grew up in the projects, the Aragon Court projects. Mm -hmm. uh, it's totally different, totally different now. But just grew up without a father, my wife, uh, my wife, my mother and I, and they have projects together, single mom on welfare. So really my story is not unlike a lot of stories you hear, mm -hmm. uh, but I guess the turnout may be a little, you know, maybe a little different. Well, and, and why is that? <sighs> I can't think of maybe just one or two of my friends who I grew up with in the projects who did not either end up uh, in jail or on the wrong side of the law or really never did anything, you know, maybe with their life. And maybe uh, maybe one or two actually didn't make it out that actually end up dying. So uh, when you say, you know, where I am today, how did I get here? Uh, if I had to say one thing that really turned it around is even though I didn't grow up with a dad, is having mentors around. You know, uh, my great uncle Charles, I mentioned him in, in my book as well, who was like a father. He's a retired Na uh, Army staff sergeant. So every once in a while I had an opportunity to be around him. Right. And he was married. He's been married now to his wife for over 55 years. Mm -hmm. So when you look at somebody like that, it's like, okay, I know my situation is not where it's supposed to be, but right. what is, is it supposed to be? And so I looked at him. And then, of course, that really led me into being a United States Marine. And I'm going to tell you, after you go to the Marine Corps and be a Marine Corps uh, infantryman, after that I said, man, I could do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Did the Marine Corps have the biggest influence on your life? Uh, initially, absolutely, the, yeah. the biggest influence. And the thing about it is that the reason I went into the Marine Corps is because I really wasn't going to go to college because I didn't have the finances and I really didn't have the smarts. I mean, I barely graduated high school. You know, uh, I always tell people a 1.9 GPA when I go to speak. I say, who can beat that? Who can beat a 1.9, you know, <laughs> you know, GPA, a little self, you know, deprivation there. But um, just in school, just not having, uh, in my opinion, not having the smarts, you know, to do things. And even now today, you know, there are some things I really have difficulty with, right. you know. So I didn't go to college. Uh, I went to junior college. I uh, went right to, a, it was PJC, now it's, you know, right. Pensacola State, right. but went to PJC after I was in law enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, so just never really having the, the smarts to do those type of things. And I, in my mind, I'm thinking if I want to make the kind of uh, finances to be able to take care of a family, I better figure out real quickly, you know, what I'm going to do. And as a kid, the teacher would always say, Steve, shut up. You talk too much. Quit talking. <laughs> and uh, now I get to I get paid to get travel out across the country talking. Imagine that, right? <laughs> well, and I and I read. I believe it was in your book um, or on some of the other material that I was reading about you. I read that you had a teacher tell you you're never going to amount to anything. Uh, Is that? Yeah. Tell me that story. Oh, golly. You know. You know, I am really big on motivation. I'm really big on putting things, you know, in the past. But even when I wrote that, I can remember tearing up. Even when I tell that story, you know, I always tear up. And even with you just saying it that quickly, it still takes me back to that moment. You know, so imagine being in the classroom, not the smartest person in the classroom, uh, failing grades, barely passing. And I can remember she was up, you know, she was teaching. I did not understand what was going on. 
Uh, but once you keep asking questions and then you start getting that, what is it now? You kind of just sit back and you don't say anything. Right. So I'm sitting back. I'm not, you know, saying anything. I'm looking around. People are doing their work. So, you know, I start, you know, making jokes. You know, I start talking. And I really shouldn't have been. Um, but she looks at me in front of the entire classroom and she says to me, you're never going to amount to anything. And of course, all the kids go, ooh. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and this is, this is high school. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not talking about elementary school. This is high school. Mm -hmm. And the bad thing about it, Jeff, is I believed her. Mm. You know, and I looked at my life and projects, not smart, not going to go to college. She's right. I'm never going to amount, you know, to anything. So I believed her. And I held onto that for a very, very long time. Is that fuel for you today? Is it, fuel, is, is it fuel for your motivation, for your goals today? You know, it is now. Yeah. But at the time, you imagine, I mean, being a child, yeah. you know, you believe those things. Sure. I mean, she's a teacher. Sure. You know, she's, she's an authoritative figure. So at the time, I believed her. Mm -hmm. But you were absolutely right. You know, a lot of people are motivated. I think I put that in my book. A lot of people are motivated by, come on, you can do it, you can do it. Right. You know, but for me, been in the Marine Corps and afterwards, you tell me I can't do something, oh, I'm definitely going to get it done. Right. As, as you look back and you work with people now and you teach people how to, to be successful in sales and communicate and whatnot, I, I'm always curious, what is it about somebody that would tell another person that, especially when it's a, an authoritative figure to a student? What, what, what drives somebody to do that? My personal opinion is they're not happy with their own lives. Yeah. They're not happy with their own lives. They're not happy where they are. They're not happy with where they're going. They don't see a future for themselves. So in order for me to say Jeff is not going to be anything, mm -hmm. you know, I have to feel bad about myself. Right. But when I feel great about myself, I want you to feel great about yourself. So that makes me want to encourage you. You know, that makes me want to motivate you, encourage you to go on, you know, and to do. So a lot of times when people are not where they want to be, they want to bring everybody else around them, you know, down to their level. And so my next question is, for a high school student or a middle school or an elementary school student for that matter, or a college right. kid for that matter, right. when somebody tells them something like that, what is your advice? How, how should they deal with it? Talk well, about resilience. Absolutely. Well, two things. The, the first thing you have to have is this. If I had someone in my life at that point that was saying, you know what, Steve, you can do anything you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you're great. You're beautiful. You're the best. Then I wouldn't have believed her. Mm -hmm. But when you don't have someone in your life who's constantly encouraging you, constantly motivating you, constantly picking you up and saying you can do it, constantly saying go forward, then you tend to believe those things, mm -hmm. all right? So what I would say to someone, a student or even an adult, because it happens you know, to adults as sure. well, to a student or an adult, don't believe what people say about you. Believe what the Word of God says about you. You see... In the Bible, and I, and I reference the Bible in my book a lot, a lot, because I really, you know, believe in it. Sure. So I had to start believing what God said about me. See, God says I'm more than a conqueror. He says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So it doesn't make a difference what Jeff says about me or a teacher says about me or even a loved one says about me. I have to believe what the Creator says about me. And when you can do that, nothing else matters what anyone else says. Conversely, if I'm a teacher, if I'm a boss, if I'm, you know, someone in management somewhere, and I see someone who is struggling, what advice do you have for me to try to help that person? If you're a manager and one of your employees is employees struggling. Or, or a student. Or, or a student, whatever. whatever, whatever absolutely. Case may, may you always, listen, I think that everybody has a sign. You know, imagine, everybody has a sign, all right? It's invisible, but the sign says, make me feel good about myself, mm -hmm. all right? So if you would just imagine that everyone you come in contact with, the person at the drive through window when you're ordering, you know, your food or the server at the restaurant, of course, your family, your wife, your kids, they may not say, make me feel good about myself because conversely, people just don't say, hey, Jeff, make me feel good about right, myself. Right, right. But if you imagine that people have that sign on them, then you're constantly going to be trying to encourage them. And I'm going to tell you something. When you can encourage someone else, it makes you feel good. Yeah, you're right. You know, so that's what I'm always telling people. If you make someone else feel good, if you do something for someone else, especially when things are not going well in your life, it makes you feel better. And you're a better human being for it. So going back to your career, so you go in the Marine Corps, so what was it like coming out of the level of poverty that you were 
in going into the United States Marine Corps. What what was that like for for <laughs> it was young the most Steve? money I ever made in my life? <laughs> was, absolutely, you know, uh, uh, going into the Marine Corps uh, benefits, you know, right. <laughs> other, uh, again, government benefits. I had I had welfare benefits, and then, <laughs> then I had government benefits in the Marine Corps. Um, but it was a it was a shocker. You know what I mean? It, it was really uh, a culture shock. And you know the biggest culture shock was actually being around people of other race. Really? Oh, yeah. Huge, huge culture shock. Because remember now, I grew up in the projects, all right? So everyone in the projects looked like me. Right. Of course, when you go to school, you know, you, you see other people of different races, but we really didn't, we didn't mix. We didn't talk. We'd say hello, right. but that was about it. When school was over, we, we'd go back home. So going into the Marine Corps and in boot camp, you are absolutely forced to be around, you know, other people, you know, of race. And if well, I'll just tell you a real quick story, is uh, you got to imagine now me growing up in the projects. So I just got my mom, and then my my grandmother. Mm -hmm. All right. So the era that they grew up in did not have a a um, a good relationship, you know, with uh, people of other race, uh, especially white people. Sure. So here I am, I go into the Marine Corps, all I know is what I've seen and what I've heard from my mother and my grandmother. So I'm on, this bu I'm on the bus and we pull up to Paris Island, South Carolina, Ura Marine Corps. <laughs> and uh, at the time, I didn't know it was a drill instructor, but a drill instructor gets on the bus, he comes to the back of the bus and he just stands there at parade rest. You know, and we're looking like, okay, what's, <laughs> what's going on? You know, he didn't say a word. So then another drill instructor gets on, he says something to the bus driver, all right? And he turns to us and he says something like, okay, when I tell you to, I want you to stand up, single file line, I want you to grab your gear, and I want you to file off, and I want you to stand on the yellow footprints. And he says, ready, go. As soon as he says go, the drill instructor in the back went crazy. <laughs> get out of here, y'all! And we all jumping up, we're bouncing into each other, you know, and falling all over. We get out, we get on yellow footprints, and I'd forgotten my wallet. <laughs> All right, and so I'm like, oh my goodness, here we go. So here's what happens. So the drill instructor says, where's your wallet? And I said, I left it on the bus. I said, the black guys are, and this was a white Marine Corps drill instructor. I said, the black guy on the bus told me, and this white drill instructor got in my face, and he said, listen to me, this is the Marine Corps. There is no black or white. We are all green. You're either light green or dark green. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first mindset of, okay, maybe we are all alike. Maybe we're all just green, just different shades of green. Uh, yeah. And from that day forward, I started to look at other people who look differently than me yeah. that we're the same. What a great story. Yeah. yeah. So after you got out of the Marine Corps, you went into law enforcement, right? I went into law enforcement uh, th about three or four months. I uh, went to Pensacola Police Department and uh, and... I guess I was looking for some of the same type of structure, you know, right. that I'd had, you right. know, in the Marine Corps. Right. And uh, so that worked out really well for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then eventually into the business world. So uh, tell me that story because that kind of launched to where you are today, right? It did. It did. So 10 years uh, into law enforcement. And then I met my wife, uh, retired Navy Chief Aaron Wilmer. And uh, we started having children. And, and I was a police officer in Illinois. So when you start to have a family, I didn't want to work those hours, right. the long hours, the shift work, and I wasn't able to go to church on Sundays. So I had to do something different, all right? So I went from uh, being a police officer to actually working at the post office, Okay. all right? You know, nine to five, you know, Monday through Saturday, Tuesday through Saturday, did that job. And I went from the post office is how I actually got into sales. I started doing a, a actually a uh, multi-level marketing company part-time while I was working for the post office and ended up making more money doing that than I was at the post office and quit the post office. People said I was crazy. As well, yeah. Yeah. Quit the post office and went full-time into commission sales. And that just kind of went from there to State Farm to where I am now. Yeah. yeah. So what do you tell people who th are thinking about making a jump like that, who are afraid to, to get oh. out of that comfort zone? What's your advice to them? I love that word you use, Jeff, jump. Yeah. And that's what I say is absolutely jump. And I'm not saying fear is not going to be there. Right. Fear will always be there. Even today, fear is always there. Sure. Coming on your show, fear was there. Right. But even when fear is present, you still have to jump. You still have to do, number one, 
uh, what makes you happy. If you've got a dream, and I believe a lot of people have given up on their dream, and mm -hmm. I believe everyone has a dream. And the only thing that stops us from doing what our dream is, it's fear. You know, so don't ever let fear stop you. So that would be my advice. You got a dream, figure it out, what you want to do, how you want to do it, what are the steps, and jump. How do you overcome that fear? You don't overcome it. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes out there is people think they have to overcome fear. Because when you say I'm overcoming fear, it's saying that you're not afraid anymore. You see, courage is not moving forward because you're not afraid. It's moving forward even though you're afraid. Okay. You see? Yeah. So fear is always there. You don't overcome fear. You recognize fear. Right. You say, yes, I see, I see you standing behind me, fear. I realize you're there. But even though you're there, it's not going to stop me from doing what needs to be done. I'm still going to jump. And, of course, that fear is fear of failure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's fear yeah. of failure. It's fear of the unknown. Right. You right. know, but when you've got faith, you see jump and the net will appear. Mm -hmm. Too many times people are afraid to jump because they don't see a net. They don't see something that's going to catch them. Right. You know, right. but if you have faith, number one, faith in God, faith in yourself, faith in the process, jump. And I promise you the net will appear. And even if you fail. You learn how not to do something. You know, you know the famous story about uh, uh, Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. You know, he says he didn't, I think it was a thousand times, you know, before he finally got the light bulb right, the right, right way. And he says, right. I didn't fail a thousand times. I found 999 ways not to make a light bulb. Right, right. You know, so we're going to fail. Right. You know, we're going to fail, we're going to fall, but the key is to get back up again and keep moving forward. But would you say also that maybe some of the, some of the best learning, some of the greatest success comes from having failed and, and learn from that and, and retool? Absolutely. And the key is learning from it. I mean, no one wants to fail. Right, right. You know, if I said, yes, Jeff, I want to fail, right. you know, I'd be lying. Right. You know, right, we'd, right. we'd love to get it right the first time and every time right, after right, that. Right. But the reality of it is it doesn't happen. Right. And the biggest thing I see is even the people that will try, if they fail, then they'll quit. Mm. You know, and you don't quit. You just figure out what you did wrong. You don't do that again and you move forward. I mean, think about Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a book that talks about 18 times he... You know, he, he ran for Congress, he failed. You know, he ran again, he failed. He ran for this, he failed. You know, he had a nervous breakdown. His first wife died. Then he ran for that, and he failed. And I mean, 18 times he failed, and then it says finally he was elected president of the United States. Mm -hmm. could, could you imagine if he had quit after five times right. or ten times or, my God, one time? Right. But you don't quit. You remember the name of that guy that, that quit? And no one else will no. <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah, they really don't. They really don't. You know, and, 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 and I think that people, probably one of the biggest fears, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong about this, but probably one of the biggest fears that people have, particularly in business and particularly in sales, is the fear of rejection. Oh. And I want you to talk about overcoming the fear of rejection. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. The fear of rejection. And no matter what business you're in, no matter what uh, organization or sales, whatever the case may be, for me, to overcome the fear of rejection is you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your product or your service or whatever the case, you know, it may be. So I was a very successful uh, insurance agent. Okay. I absolutely, 100% believed that the products and services I have to offer can help Jeff Weeks uh, with his family you know, and protect, protect your family and your livelihood. Mm -hmm. So I really wasn't worried if you wanted my product or service or not because you have to think about it as being in a lifeboat. And I'll just tell you a quick story. So imagine that you're in a lifeboat mm -hmm. and your customers are in the water and they're surrounding you, okay? And they're doing every single thing they can to stay afloat. They're bobbing up and down. They're treading water. They don't want to drown. And, Jeff, you're throwing your customers life jackets as fast as you can. And some of your customers will take the life jacket and they're holding on for dear life. But some of your customers, they don't want the life jacket. They just throw it away. Right. Now, if this were true, you would not feel rejected because somebody didn't want your life jacket. You kind of feel sorry for them. Right. Right? It's right. like, what's wrong with you? I'm, I'm trying to save your life. Take my life jacket. Right. And just because customer number one didn't want your life jacket, would it stop you from throwing a life jacket to number two? Right. Or number three? Right. You see, we have to have the same mentality when we're talking with our 
customers or our prospects or other people, or whatever the case may be. You know, we have to keep throwing those life jackets because we know what we have will help protect them or will actually help them. And of course, that would be applicable too for somebody who is maybe trying to get another job or something like that if they get turned down by an employer. The, oh, absolutely. The employer's missing out on that person, right? You know how many times I've been turned down? Probably a lot. A lot. Yeah. You know, <laughs> a lot. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, yeah. a lot. You know, yeah. they missed out because, I mean, I didn't have the, I don't have the degree. Right. You know, I didn't have the degree or the pedigree. Right. You know, uh, right. from the wrong side of the tracks. Right. So think about the the employers out there who missed out on having Steve Wilmer as one of their employees. Yeah. Speaking of fear, speaking of jumping, you jumped from being successful in the insurance business to going out on your own to being an entrepreneur in the truest sense of the word, hand-to-hand -hand combat, if, you, if you will, because, Absolutely. I mean, you're having to drum up business to, yep. to, to teach people. What was that like for you? Uh, scary. Fear. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, that story is, is, is really, really great. Uh, so here I am uh, teaching insurance in pretty, pretty good in my own respect to the point where people started hearing about it and I started doing teachings and training. Now, I understand this. Jeff, I've been speaking and teaching for about the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Someone was always calling me saying, hey, can you come over here and teach? Can you come do this class? Can you come speak at this event? So for about 10 years, I've been teaching, speaking, not one-on-one -on -one coaching, but, you know, maybe coaching a group of people. So I'm selling insurance. I'm great at it. People start calling me. I started teaching them, started teaching their, their team. Uh, and a company, uh, the Risk Advisor Institute, a company hears about it, comes down, interviews myself and my agent at the time, John Kaziah, John Kaziah State Farm, uh, interviews myself and John, and they put us on a CD and, and a DVD and they sent us all across the country. And when that happened, we really started getting phone calls. Let me talk to Steve, let me talk to Steve. I ended up contacting the company and said, hey, you know, I'm teaching, I'd love to, you know, maybe help you and teach or something like that. So fast forward, they say, yeah, they bring me out. My first paid speaking engagement was in um, Dodge City, Kansas. Now. I'm a wide earth fan. I mean, no, no, no. I am a wide earth fan. When I was a deputy sheriff, I used to have some of my friends they'd say, that's wide earth. Here's wide earth coming. So for me to go to Dodge City, Kansas with my first speaking engagement, oh, I loved it. So I go out there, great turnout. Two weeks later, I want me to go to another city, and it goes on and on. While I'm still selling insurance, I'm doing this part time. And Jeff, I'm loving it. I'm having a ball. I'm living my dream. I'm living my passion. And so I fast forward maybe six months, and the company contacts me and says, you know what, you're really, really good at this. You ever think about doing this full time? And I say, yeah, I think about it all the time. You know, so again, talk to my wife. Here's another career move, right? <laughs> talk to my wife and, uh, of course, prayed about it. Uh, talk to my pastor. I get the answer, and I start Steve Speaks. And I've been traveling and having more fun than I've ever had, you know, before. Finances never took a dip. They continually, you know, to increase. God is good. I'm living my passion. I'm telling you, if it can happen from a little black boy in the projects, man, it can happen for anybody. <laughs> How did the book come about? Oh, my gosh, the book. Again, I'm just up speaking, okay? And I, I do a presentation called 10 to Win. I finished the presentation People are in tears. You know, people are coming up, you know, congratulating me. And they, uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine now. At the time, he was an associate. I'd known him. His name is Eldon Scott. So Eldon comes up to me and says, man, that was, that was awesome. You know, is that a book? I'm like, no, it's, it's not a book. What do you mean it's a book? No, it's not a book. It's a speech. <laughs> he says, dude, I think you just wrote a book. You know, so we collaborate, you know, together. And... Uh, Maybe four months later, maybe five months later, uh, we put it together, and now uh, you have the finished product in your hand, 10 to win, the top 10 ways to win in life and business. Give me a couple of the most important ones. The most important ones. How about I give you some of my favorites, and then I'll tell you, them, the, in my opinion, the most important one. I got about three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, number one is dream. We've been talking about dream. You got you to gotta have a dream. Uh, that's chapter one. And then I like chapter five. It's called all out. 
Once you find your dream, go all out, Jeff. You don't let anything stop you. You move forward. Yeah, you're going to fall, but you get back up and you keep moving forward. And then my favorite, absolutely, is chapter 10. And basically, chapter 10 is keeping the main thing the main thing. You see, the chapters 1 through 9 mean absolutely nothing unless it's God, family, and then business. And too many times, and I've done it myself, I get those things mixed up. Mm -hmm. And I worry about business first. Mm -hmm. And I make the excuse, well, I'm doing it for my family. Nope, 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 nope. God, family, and then business. You have to keep the main thing the main thing. I know, too, in about, in about two minutes here, you speak some on fatherhood. What's some of the best advice you have? <sighs> Golly. I've got, I've got, I mean, me growing up without a father, um, I've got four beautiful children, Judah, Josiah, Joy, and Jana. I make a lot of mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. But the best advice I would give is to ask for forgiveness and ask for it quickly. Son, I messed up. I apologize. Dad got it wrong. All right? And especially with the boys, love on them. Hug them. Give them a kiss. Tell them you love them. All right? One of the biggest mistakes I see fathers make is they're... they're they're open and honest like that with their daughters, but they won't do it with their sons. And I'm telling you, your sons need that love just as much as your daughter, if not more. They're looking for that. I know I was looking for it when I was a kid. Is there another book in you? There's about two or three in me, but man, that, that one right there took a lot out of me. So I, I don't know. I don't know how soon those other two or three are coming. <laughs> oh. Well, congratulations on all of your success. Wish you the very best as you continue to spread your passion uh, if you could just get a little enthusiasm, you'd be good to go. <laughs> <laughs> and think the teacher says, Steve, shut up. You talk too much. I love it. I love it. <laughs> what a great story, my friend. It was a thank pleasure. You. Are you kidding me? Again, thank you for having me. I appreciate you. My pleasure. My pleasure. His name is Steve Wilmer. He's lived it. He came up the hard way and is uh, making quite of a success of himself. The name of his book is 10 to Win, the top 10 ways to win in life and in business. Uh, it's good read. And as you can see, guy's got just a little bit of passion, a little bit of enthusiasm. <laughs> it's uh, somewhat contagious, I would say. By the way, Steve's website is stevewilmer.com. You can see many more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also on Facebook and YouTube. And by the way, if there's a particular show you like, feel free to share it via social media. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.